Courtney, co-founder of Hippie and uh, one of tonight's moderators, along with co-host Ksenia, who you just heard. Um, so we hope everyone's been staying safe for starters. If you haven't already, could you please mute yourself uh, so that you don't in accidentally interrupt while the presentation is going? Uh, at the end or throughout the presentation, feel free to post questions in the chat. Uh, myself and Ksenia will collect all the questions and we'll ask them all at the end and get uh, Nicholas to, to answer them. So tonight's uh, talk is being delivered by Nicholas Frankel. He's an experienced developer advocate and uh, with broad industry experience. He doubles as an educator with universities and higher education schools. And he then triples as an author having written several books. So without further ado, Nicholas's talk tonight on change data capture. I'll hand over to you, Nicholas. Thank, thanks a lot for the introduction. So, well, I don't need to introduce myself. Um, for like 17 years, I worked as a tech guy. And since, well, like two years ago, nearly two years ago, I decided that I had enough to work uh, with real world projects, which basically were always the same. And the most interesting stuff was uh, the technical part, but you had a lot of hiccups regarding the organization and the management and all. All of that so now I decided hey let's become a developer advocate so at least I work on fun applications where I, I hope that you will find this tonight interesting I work for a company called Hazelcast Hazelcast has two main products um, uh, well two products actually um, one of them is in memory data grid and basically you can think about an in memory data grid like as a distributed data structure. So if you are in the Java space, for example, you know about the map interface. Well, we have our, our own map interface, which basically is very, very similar to the Java's map interface. And then from the contours of this API, we will provide you with a distributed implementation. Uh, JET is um, a stream processing engine. And since I will be discussing a bit more about it, uh, in the talk, then I, I, I won't talk further about. So imagine that you have an application and, well, you have performance issues. I mean, it's not uncommon. It might be because the code was not that great. It might be because of infrastructure reasons. It might be for, well, a, a lot of different reasons. And if, if you are an experienced architect, then the first reflex in general is to set up a cache. And, Everybody is happy because it improves the performance. Now, if you are really experienced, you know that uh, by uh, having a cache, basically you are trading performance and also availability uh, for stale data. So you, you, you might not have the latest data, but at least it's there very, very fast. So I have this system, and in that case, I have an app. And it will um, basically get the data from the database. And when the cache is hot, then it will directly read the cache. And of course, if the application is the only component that writes to the database, it can as well write to the cache. And so in the end, you actually don't interact that much with the database. You interact mainly with the cache by reading, and so you've got like huge performance measures. Everybody is happy and that goes on and on for ages until somebody decides that, well, we need to write to the database, but your application is not the one component doing that. So there is another component. For example, there is a bad job and um, that bad job and needs to update uh, a reference table, for example. And now you have an issue because your cache is not the main point of entry. And so basically, how does your cache know that something has changed? So how to keep the cache in sync with the database? And probably you know about this quote that uh, there are two hard things in computer science, naming things, cache invalidation, and of course, off by one errors. So there are two things. First is the cache eviction. And cache eviction is actually the fact that when the cache 
which is, is max capacity, what strategy do you use to remove the entities? And this is not interesting in that case. What is interesting to us is the time to live. So your cache is not full, but how long do you keep your entity in the cache? And afterwards, when the entity is not there anymore, then your application will check, hey, there is nothing in the cache. It will read in the database and put that in the cache for the next usage. So how do you, do you set this TTL? Because that's the most important stuff. Well, in general, there is no frequency in the changes. If there is a frequency, that's cool, because then you can, if you have a bad job, for example, that runs daily, then it's easy. Then you, you, you make the TTL exactly or, or, or like a bit less than the frequency, and then everything is good. But in general, it's very hard to predict when there will be changes in the database. And so you have two problems. And on, on one side, you, you can it's miss updates. So you, you, you will probably have large frequency or not frequent uh, refreshes. And in that case, you will, you will miss updates so that during a certain time, your cache will serve stale data, which might be okay in certain use case, might be not. On the other hand, if you want to avoid that problem, then you will make the update frequency more frequent. But then if nothing has changed, you will be basically wasting resources. And if you are using the cloud, you are paying for this waste and it's not that great either. And so still the problem stands. So you could have a, a dedicated polling process, um, but you still have the problem regarding the frequency. So it, 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 the, 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 the fact that we have a frequency issue probably means that we should like switch our view and, and go for even driven. So basically, if there is nothing happening, you don't need to do anything. And as soon as something happens, then you do it. And if you have a rapid succession of events, then you do it every time. And if for some time nothing happens, you do nothing. So it's very efficient that way. How would you implement events in that case? Well, the easiest way, if you have, have been uh, using a rational database management system, is, is through triggers. And I mean, it's natural. Uh, the problem is first that not all database uh, implement triggers. And the second problem is um, how do you call an external process from the trigger? Because in that case, you, you don't want the trigger to change the data inside the database. You want the um, database to trigger something that will update the cache. Um, I, I've tried to, to find um, a, an answer to this question. So I will be using MySQL in that case. And there is something in MySQL exactly for that. It's called a user defined function. But the problem is there are a, a couple of, of limitations. So first is that the function must be written in C++. And to be honest, I'm a Java developer. Now I'm a Kotlin developer, C++. I studied it when I was in university 20 years ago. Never wrote a line. It's not that great in my opinion. But of course, you can find people who are able to write C++. So it's OK. Now, uh, the operating system must support dynamic loading of libraries, which might not that be great. Uh, especially if you want to avoid security issues. And now it, it becomes part of the running server. So you are bound to all the constraints. Um, so in the end, well, it works. Um, and this is an example of that. So uh, basically you have this uh, command here, which will send the system exec to the, to the operating system. And Basically, with that, you are able uh, to, to, to achieve that. So there is this library that does it. You don't need to write the C++ function for you. You just need to write the command you want to execute. I didn't check if it's, uh, it, it's still uh, updated, if it's still developed, but at least it exists. So you, you, it works more or less.
The problem is first it's implementation dependent um, because again, I, I used my SQL example, uh, Oracle, I didn't check. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, Postgres implement triggers. Well, there are issues. Uh, then it's like super fragile, like everything in the chain is super fragile. So uh, if, if something happens, like if there is the bug, where does it come from? Who will debug it? And um, is it in the library, is it in, in the system command, is it in the trigger? It, it's, it's very hard to understand this kind of stuff. I mean, if you have been doing microservices, despite what everybody tells you, uh, you know, microservices is just like making sure that you will ne never, never resolve a, a, a murder mystery. It's once like if you have not proper monitoring in place, then it will be impossible to debug. And here it's the same, and but you are constrained by the tools. But perhaps if you have been uh, following the latest trends regarding uh, databases, you might have heard about change data capture. Like change data capture seems to be a quite old stuff that uh, is hype again. And basically change data capture is, um, you, is a way to listen to changes that happen in your database and deliver those changes as events. And there are old ways to do that, and there is a, the, the real new way and quite useful way to do that. The, the first thing that you can do by yourself is, is um, you can have a dedicated column, a timestamp column, and, and when there is a change in that, well, you can say, hey, here, this column has changed. You can do the same with version or status. Uh, we already saw that we can do that with triggers. But um, what is now uh, very modern, very contemporary, is log scanners. What are log scanners? Well, it, it comes from um, a, a talk uh, or an article, sorry, by uh, Martin Kepman, who is very, very active in the database even space. And he, he calls it turning the database inside out. And in this article, he mentioned that basically, uh, when you have a leader follower replication uh, in, in a traditional database, then you have um, like a way that the followers replicates the changes in the leader. And for sure, this is an implementation detail, but basically if you add something that could read that replication stream, you would be aware of every change. Just as, as a follower is aware of every change, then you, component or whatever, would be aware of this every change. And the implementation of such an event stream, in most cases, at least in all cases that I know, is an immute uh, append only log. So basically, you write everything to a log file, and afterwards, the, uh, a component inside the database reads this log. Of course, it keeps a cursor, and it processes the instruction. And when the instruction as is processed, the cursor moves, and then it goes to the next instruction. And if there is a crash, then the cursor hasn't moved yet. And so the replication process starts from where the last cursor was points to. And in general, you have this log for two reasons, replication, but also for data recovery. So the idea behind um, change data capture is, is to hack this log and to use this log to do the, the change data capture. So if, if we are just another component that reads this log and we keep a cursor, then we can capture the event. And this is very interesting because it, it's completely opposite to uh, the, the event sourcing uh, approach. So basically the event sourcing approach is you store the, the events in the database and then when you want to have the aggregation, then you do the computation. Of course, since events might be uh, uh, like, there might be many, many events and they can be uh, like very old and run into a long past, then you will at some point make snapshots so that uh, when you actually query the data, it's, it's much faster. But here it's different. We, we, we still store the, 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 the status, the aggregation, 
but then we make something out of, of the event. And here, for example, is a sample of the bin log of MySQL. And you, you can see, you can recognize some instruction like update, where, set. And also you can, um, like, there is some stuff that is much harder to understand. So it's like, it's like the Rosetta Stone. But um, if we imagine that uh, we could read that, we can write an implementation to read that, then we can have change data capture. But then we get back to the same problem. It's implementation dependent, it's super fragile, and in the end, who maintains, debugs it? So I don't want to write the, 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 um, the code that analyzes it. I, I, because it might, my SQL might change the way that it writes the log and then everything will break. I want, let's say somebody who takes care of that. And there is already a component that does it for us. Actually, there is something called Debezium, and perhaps you have heard about that. It's, it's Java-based abstraction layer for change data capture. And basically, you, you have this API, and then you have a connector that is dependent on the database implementation. And then you put both of them into the class pass and, and presto. And if you need to change your database, you just need to change the connector. The API will stay the same. Same. The good thing about Debezium, it's it's provided by Renad, so it's it's not a small actor. I mean, it's a big player in the ecosystem, especially it's in the open source ecosystem. It's um, Apache two license, so you can use it in your own application. Now there is a con, as always, it's very very skewed toward Kafka because the usual use case is, uh, yeah, those are, sorry, the, the list of connectors. So as you can see already, you can already use MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, and SQL Server, the Microsoft stuff. And there are al already some incubating one, even DB2. So if you are stuck on old architecture, you can still like enjoy the benefits of CDC on, on your old system. So yeah, as I mentioned, it's very skewed toward Kafka because by default, it's available as a Kafka connector. So basically you would uh, set up your, 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 your Kafka uh, uh, architecture, then you will deploy the jar and MySQL or Postgres or whatever. And then every time there is a change, then they will be sent to queues, sorry, to topics in, in Kafka. And that's an issue because Sometimes you don't want to use Kafka. Why wouldn't you want to use Kafka? Uh, the, the benefit of Kafka is it's persistent. Uh, the con of, of Kafka is it's, it's persistent, meaning that if you want to write and then want to read, then you need to access the disk. And of course, it takes a lot more time to access the disk than to access the memory. Fortunately, we have something called Hazelcast Jet. So I hope you probably know about Jet, um, especially in this in-memory computing meetup. If you don't know about it, it's a stream processing engine. It's distributed, it's in-memory, it embeds Hazelcast IMDG, so it can leverage it. It's also a to license. And of course, we have an enterprise offering just in case you need it with monitoring, security, all the nice stuff. If you want to play with it, you can uh, just download it and have the open source version. And JET, as I mentioned, is, is uh, like an in-memory stream processing engine. So basically, we can read from different sources, we can write to different sources, and we can do everything inside, like enrich uh, the stream. Or, and of course, it's distributed by default. So it's not only distributed locally on the different nodes, but uh, uh, sorry, on the different cores, but also over the network if you have multiple nodes. Uh, you can do aggregation. Well, it, it's the, in that case, it's, it's standard stuff if you have been using a stream processing engine already. And one of the, the, the sources is actually change events. And so basically what, what we do is we, we hack, we, we get an, an overlay, so an additional layer over Debezium and so that we, we can get the events the events now are not sent to Kafka because it's not uh, uh, um, deployed in a Kafka cluster. It, it's deployed inside the JET cluster. And basically, we can get the, the events 
uh, inside our, our pipeline. Ah. I forgot that. Um, and so we have two deployment modes. The easiest deployment mode, if you want to play, is since it's, it's a JAR, uh, you can just use it as a dependency. And um, then you can already create your uh, instance directly. And the networking is very easy. Basically, they broadcast on the same network. And if, they if two nodes find each other, then they will automatically form a cluster. Of course, in cloud environments, you don't want to do this kind of stuff. And perhaps the network doesn't allow you to anyway. So we have a dedicated configuration. But by default, to make things simple, broadcast from a cluster, everybody is happy. That's good to play with. But the problem is that in that case, you need to scale your application nodes uh, along your um, Java Jet nodes. And in general, in production, you don't want to do that. In general, what you want to do is you want to scale them independently because uh, perhaps you need more uh, apps nodes or perhaps in general, you need more Jet nodes. Um, so we also have a client server architecture. And in that case, um, you don't need to use Java. You can use Java, but we have a lot of different languages that we support. For example, we support JavaScript for Node.js, Python, C, C++, C Sharp. JET has two concepts, the concept of a pipeline. And basically, the pipeline is declarative code. So if you have uh, been working uh, with streams in Java or um, with functional programming, it looks a lot like, like functional stuff you read from, then you can map, then you can filter, then you can do whatever, and then you can write. And when you have declared that code, then you, you send the code to the stream processing engine, and then it becomes a job. And the stream processing engine takes care of distributing it over the network and on each node to distribute it over the cores. So let's get back to our use case because in the end, I just want to have this cache updated. So imagine that now we have this just job and when something happens on the database, whatever happens, we will watch the change and we will get the change, analyze the change event and update the cache accordingly. That would be super cool. So I hope that now my demo will work because again, it's my first time. So even though I rehearsed a lot of time, you know, demo effect and all of that. Here I have this architecture. So uh, who is not at ease with Java code? Please tell me, then I will be very, very uh, detailed. If you are more at ease, then I can like just keep it a bit. Don't be shy. Everybody is happy with Java codes. That's fine. So I have uh, this application and I have this um, database. And I will, okay, so what I will do, I will do everything inside of IntelliJ because otherwise you won't see my terminal. Uh, Docker. Compose down, and I will start it inside of IntelliJ. Here, Docker Compose up. It's finished, finished. Let's do it. So everything is starting, everything is happy. And I have one node. Sorry, I have one service, which is the pipeline, and I will kill it because I don't want it to work for now. I want it to work when I want it to work to show you here what, what, what's the issue when you have something that uh, updates your code behind your back. Background, Docker, Compose, Stop, Pipeline. Okay. And now I will need to switch again my screen to Firefox. 
and now you have this application and this application is super nice right um and it works so i will write johnny i can update it it works i can refresh still works jenny sorry i have no no good idea this kind of stuff now imagine that um i have an app that updates the data i will switch to intellij and that's exactly what i will do so i have I have a, a Spring application that uses the command line, which is called update. And basically what I can do with it is I can update the data. So here I can say lists me all the entities in the table. So it tells me Johnny, Jenny, good. Now I will update the first entity. So this one, and I want it to say now its name is Robert. So let's check that in the table, his name is Robert. But unfortunately, since my cache is not updated, then my application still think that the name is Johnny because it reads from the cache. So now I want to put CDC in place. And by, oh, sorry. Yes, so I shared the, the good stuff. So now I want to put CDC in place and I get back here and I will, um, so Docker compose start pipeline. So now the pipeline should be in place and it tells me a lot of stuff. I just need the GVM to start. So JET has started and basically it reads everything. Now it should be on. And if I ah, I forgot, I refresh, but it's already refreshed here. So now I've got Robert. And if I make changes, so I, I won't switch the screen, but I make a new change, an external change. And I will say, oh, I will update uh, the entity two with rows. Then I have rows. So every time I make changes to the database, then it's reflected back in, in the cache. And that's amazing because that means that now my cache is always sync with the database. So I don't need to interact with the database anymore. I just need to interact with the cache, which is super, super, super fast because, well, the cache is in memory. And So I, 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 in this talk, I try to uh, tell you about the caching trade-off. Yeah, it's good. You are very, very fast. You are performant, but you might have stale data. But in many, many cases, stale data work. But in some other cases, stale data don't work. Um, and in order to correct that, we have even based architectures. Um, however, the implementation is very, um, might be very fragile. So in the ecosystem, in that case, we have change data capture and change data capture implemented through Debezium and Hazelka's Jet. And then you have your application that benefits from an evergreen cache. So you have cache that is always hot. So thanks for your attention. You can read my blog, you can follow me on Twitter, and more importantly, you can get the codes for this application that um, you might want to read. So now if I go on IntelliJ again, IntelliJ, I might show you how simple that looks. So this is the pipeline. This is a pipeline. So this is the job. And the pipeline is here you have the configuration, which takes a lot of time, uh, of, of lines of code, sorry. 
but the, the, the pipeline is actually this short. This is the magic. So basically you tell it, hey, read the Debezium configured with those parameters. And basically parameters are to read from MySQL. Uh, we don't need timestamp, we could, but then read the value, convert it to basically a key value pair. Now we have this class that basically transform a JSON, uh, sorry, transform a string, so a JSON into an ID and a person that can be put into the cache. And, and, and it is done. So with only those few lines of code, you can get this result. So now if you have some questions, I will be happy to hear them. Okay, yeah. So there were a few questions in the chat and to me earlier. Uh, the yes. first one was from Dennis. How does JET capture changes from HDFS? Is it something built in or a third party framework? HDFS? Uh, but here, sorry. Yes, I, I didn't show HDFS. I, I just showed CDC. So it, it's, it's for the Bezium. Yeah, I can clarify, Nicholas. If that was my question. On some of the, on some of the, on the, on the, on the first slides when you were introducing Jet, you showed that uh, uh, the this one. engine can capture. Yeah, we are from files. You see, you can stream changes from files. Yes. Uh, do I need to develop anything uh, in house, or do you provide any out of the box kind of uh, APIs that can? Uh, let's say, uh, read data from the IGDFS files. I just see this IGDFS listed. So you, you will see that I was a very bad consultant or a very good one because I, I, I can say I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't play right. with it yet, so I, I cannot say for sure. I can check for sure. I, I will write a note and, and get back to you. Right, grand, grand. thanks. But overall, yeah, thanks, for the, thanks for the presentation. It was really educational. And easy to absorb and easy to understand. Well, I don't make hard you know, presentations because if first I'm not that hard. <laughs> and, and, and the second reason is basically if there is only one person in the room that the, who can follow, that's not interesting. I prefer to reach as many people as possible. Good. Uh, we have uh, more questions for you, Nicholas. Sure. The, the next one was, uh, is transactional consistency maintained between queries to the cache derived from the log and queries to the DBs? If so, no. how is this achieved? No, there is no transactional boundary. It's up to you to manage the transaction by yourself. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, is this only for Java? So could you use other languages uh, to get this behavior? So what, what you can do is, you, I mean, what is Java here is the job itself. So I will change, share my screen uh, again. What is Java E here is the pipeline and the app. The pipeline needs to stay in Java because that's how it's, it works now. But as you can see in the end, I'm writing in the IMDG, I'm writing in, in the entities map. And as I mentioned, uh, we have client server architecture. So your app actually can be written in Python or in C sharp, and you can benefit from that. The pipeline is Java, but the rest is you can use any stack that we offer client with. Okay. Uh, what's the impact on performance of using CDC? Well, that's a good question. Um, actually, not that much. Um, because uh, as I mentioned, you are, you are reading the bin log itself. And the, uh, I mean, if you have other nodes, they're already using this bin log. So the, the impact might be uh, perceptible when you uh, start using this bin log. So if you have only one master node, well, I don't know how much it can be, let's say, let's say 
because then you, 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 you have this bin log set up. But once you have at least one node that is reading, you can consider um, a Debezium as just another node. And so the more nodes you have, you will just add one more node. It's not okay. a real node. But basically, that means that your master will push the, the, the changes to this one more node. And so it will be not very important in the end. Okay. Of course, uh, it needs to be done in your own, on your own infrastructure, in your own context. Cool. Uh, I'll pick up the last two that came in off the chat. So the, yeah, the question is, will the presentation deck be shared? Yes, I can share the presentation deck and I ask for no additional fees. <laughs> Good. Um, and then it seems that massive updates applied to an origin DB will produce multiple cache evictions in IMDG. How could this problem be solved? Remember, the cache cash eviction only happens if you go over the limits of the items that you have set. So in, you can manage cache eviction saying, hey, if my DB had 10,000 entities, then my uh, cache has, 10, 000, uh, has space for 10,000 entities, and you will never have cache eviction. Never. So you, right. you can manage that by yourself. Awesome. What happens if there are DB schema changes? Uh, so far, Debezium will also um, like send events for those changes. Um, like here, for example, you can see uh, what I'm sharing right now. Am I sharing my slides or my code? Code. Code, perfect. Here you, you, you can see that I, I, I was not interested in the schema changes. Uh, but <clears throat> basically, this is a non, it's a real problem, but it shouldn't be a problem because anyway, if your database schema change, your application and your cache will change anyway. So you will need to make changes to your whole architecture anyway. So when you do that, you just update your uh, cache pipeline and it will be the same. And as you can see, if you um, have if you can architect your stuff in, in, a, in a good way, then you, you need just to change this code, which is acceptable, in my opinion. Right. How is data secured? So um, data is secured because, but here, of course, I didn't secure it because, again, I'm super lazy, it's just a demo. But you can find the Debezium uh, configuration parameter and you, you will use uh, TLS to get the data. So in that case, it will be as secure as your certificate and uh, the way that you care about your certificate. Okay, I've got one last question for you. Um, it was, can you achieve uh, fine grain authorization controls with CDC either using um, Debezium or anything else that you have in the stack? So far, as far as I know, it's up to you to implement this fine grain control. Like um, Debezium will just stream the changes and it will be up to your like client code to say, okay, this I allow or this I don't allow or this I accept or this I don't accept. Um, it, it will be up to you. Okay. Uh, that was the, the last of the questions. Um, Ksenia uh, is recording the call, uh, so the session will be uploaded once it's been processed. Um, I'll hand over to you now, Ksenia, if there's anything you want to add on the end of this. If you don't mind, I just have one, one last question. Uh, sorry, I did not type in. Uh, sorry for hijacking. Nicholas, I, I, what would you advise for failover handling let's say that jet cluster uh, goes down like how 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 would i let's say uh, and i want to stream the changes from a specific timestamp what should i use because in kafka you brought in that in kafka we have persistence and in kafka as far as i remember they also allow you to read the changes from a specific timestamp is jet somehow different in this direction so the first is um it will be very well everything is possible but it will be very hard to bring the whole cluster down. And because 
uh, what will happen probably is one node might get down, like you are in Kubernetes, the GVM is like is massively garbage collecting. So you, it, Kubernetes kills the nodes. That's fine. Because the good thing is everything is distributed and everything is snapshotted. If you're interested about how uh, Jet handles the, the, the snapshots, um, one of my colleagues did uh, a talk about the uh, Shady Lamp ports algorithm, and, and that's the algorithm that we are implementing. Um, so, because um, like Jet uh, basically creates a directed acyclic graph, and through this algorithm, we are able to make smart snapshotting. So basically, as long as there is at least one node running, and of course, the more nodes you have, the more chances you have that you have at least one node running, then it will restart at the last time that it got, before it got killed. Okay, all right, thanks. So thanks everybody. I really appreciate uh, your attendance. If you have feedback, I will be very happy to have it. Of course, it's, if it's good feedback, it's good for my ego. If it's bad feedback, it's good for the next audience, the next set of attendees. Mm -hmm. So in both cases, it's fine. Don't be shy. Uh, ping me on Twitter, ping me on anywhere. I, I will try to, uh, to handle the feedback. Thanks a lot again. Thank you, Nikos. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening and stay safe. Bye. <laughs>